if you guys can see that. I'll get it a little closer. Minus 15. I was uh, I was coming out to this beautiful area to do some filming. Fuck that. It's way too cold. Um, I'll get back to you guys here shortly. Way too bitter. Uh, way too bitter. I'd like to thank uh, Rick Souther. Bangor, Maine, Darling Ford. Appreciate the hats, buddy. Uh, not a paid endorsement, just a shout out. Uh, I'll get back to you with you guys here in a little bit, but minus 15 is, I'm Alaska native, but I, I, ain't, I ain't getting down with that. No, no, too much. I'll, uh, I'll get back with you shortly. Almost forgot I was gonna show you the little sis sitting in the river here. Look at the color of that ice. Just beautiful here. I mean, look up that canyon there. I mean, what a beautiful place. All right, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Hey, greetings, this is Fred in Alaska. Uh, found a little warmer place, um, not by much. Yet. I'm basically uh, in a little bit of a canyon that uh, goes up into Hatcher's Pass. I'm not. I'm not going all the way up there. Um, it. It's just. I, I'm not going to walk around. I'm going to show you the little Sioux sit in the river froze up over here in just a minute. Um, again, thanks again to Rick Souther, Bangor, Maine, Darling Ford. Again, not a sponsor. Just a shout out. Sent me some hats. Think they're pretty cool. Um, what I wanted to share with you today um, comes from David. Uh, he's First Nations. He's from Bristol Bay. He uh, known the guy a long time. Um, what he shared with me uh, happened at his grandpa's cabin on the west channel of the Nushigak River, which is due west of Portage Creek. On the map, it says Kiefer Cutoff. I don't know where they got that garbage, but in between the east channel and the west channel, there's all these sloughs that that vary depending on the overflow and the breakup of the ice and and things of that nature um but one of his favorite things to do uh what i'm sharing with you occurred back in the early into the mid 90s it, it everything transpired over the course of about three to four years now what he was dealing with was he he would go up to his up his cabin his grandpa and he would basically get it ready for family visitors, you know, to come up, sport fish, you know, set a, a, a net for white fish, you know, pike, uh, marmot, all, all that kind of stuff. Well, his, his uppa took him up there. This was roughly, uh, from his recollection, 91 or 92. Um, they got up there into May. He got, you know, his uppa stayed with them a day or two. They got, you know, certain things ready. He was going to build a generator shack um and some other stuff for his uppa so during the course of what he was doing uh he had pine cones thrown at him at first and he just because he was surrounded by you know spruce trees and and what have you he just chalked it up to eh, squirrel up there you know whatever and that was easy enough to dismiss um for about three to four nights in a row he kept hearing thumping on the roof and you know when he would go out to check he would just notice these little grass uh dirt you know uh grass with the roots stuck in a little basically grass clumps and dirt and you know he thought it was odd um so what he would do is uh, he got grabbed a long pole uh actually it was a dip netting pole and he would pull him off the roof like uh, he didn't understand why he he didn't he wasn't uh, he wasn't putting two and two together. He was just like, this is weird. You know, maybe someone is playing a prank on me because uh, his older brother used to play pranks on him when they were younger. So he figured, oh, well, maybe, you know, they went up the East Channel and then drifted back down and were messing with me, trying to startle me or scare me. So he, he easily dismissed that stuff. Now, 
after about being up there about a week, he had gotten the generator shed done and uh, basically just traditional log cabin style built, you know, out of rounds. And he decided, you know, I, I have plenty of canned food and rice, but I, I want some fish. So uh, salmon weren't running yet. So he went and set the whitefish net and he set it in one of these little sloughs. And it, it wasn't a very big net. It doesn't have to be a narrow channel, wasn't very deep water. He was out to catch pike and whatnot. So he went and set it. And the very next morning, he went back to check it. Now, when he goes back to check it, he noticed it was all wound up. And so he gets over to it, he untangles it, nothing in it, of course. And so he resets it, goes back, does his thing around the cabin, some more grass clumps that night. Thought nothing of it when he saw it again. He 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 knew he would figure out the culprit eventually, and it, he he had nothing to startle him or worry him at this point. Um, he had plenty of firearms. There was multiple shotguns in the cabin, heavy caliber rifles. He he, as far as weaponry, there's bears over there. You know, there's Bristol Bay, the big brown bears, massive brown bears. So there was plenty of firepower. He was not concerned uh, initially with his safety. Now, the next morning when he goes back to check the net, uh, it was uh, in Alaska that time of year. It's it's different than down in states um, because we're on the upward scale of land of the midnight sun. So it doesn't get dark until later and it's lighter much earlier, right? So he was roughly up at about 4, 4.30, and he left the cabin at about 6. And so he skips right up the slough. It wasn't that far away, just right up one of the sloughs and just around the bend a little bit from where his grandpa's cabin is. Now, when he gets there this day, he notices some twigs in the mesh of the net, and he thought nothing of it. He figured, oh, washed out twigs and branches. I'll just pick them out and grab whatever fish is there. Well, when he gets up on the net and he pulls it over the bow of the skiff to pick through it, these alders or willows, whatever they were, were weaved into the mesh. And there was, he said there was about three to four of them all weaved in, uh, basically in the same area of the net, which was in the deepest part of the channel. And it, it boggled his mind. He's never seen driftwood weaved into a net like that. So he was like, someone's gotta be someone's gotta be messing with me so he took the time sat right there pulled them out mended the net where he needed to and reset it goes back to the cabin does some more things uh changes out some tar paper uh, that he was going to use that was old and put up some new stuff on the shed he just built for the generator he knew within a week his upper would be back up with the generator and some guys to help him unload it from the skip and and so on so he was doing his thing he got it tarred up and uh, he started putting moss on top you know traditional style just moss on top he was walking back about nah, not quite 100 yards to the, where the tree line breaks and it opens up into tundra heading west towards where like dillingham basically so he's out there he's cutting out chunks of moss you know from the tundra rolling it up packing it on back over and as he was getting it up there uh he noticed that it was very very quiet and it, it being so quiet he grew concerned because of bears now he had been there without seeing any bears and, and let's be honest he was complacent so immediately he goes ah, it's too quiet I better go get one of the shotguns so he goes and he gets himself a shotgun make sure he's got proper bear ammo in it throws it over his shoulder well he goes back collecting his moss doing his thing and just as he was getting the last section of moss to put on this shed that he built for his upper's generator, he comes back and all the moss he had up there had been slid down, um, tearing part of the tar paper and some other stuff. And he was like, what the hell is this? He heard no skiffs. He looked for, cause uh, he was basically traipsing some, some bits of soil and stuff. He was looking for someone's tracks, any sign. And he said he didn't see anything. So he fixes everything again. He, he get, finally gets it all done. And uh, 
he ended up nailing down some boards to hold the moss into place basically so he does that figures okay well i'm gonna go and check the net see if there's any fish whatsoever i'm not gonna wait overnight i'm gonna go check it now see if i could at least get fresh pike or something different to eat than the rice and the canned goods so he skips across and gets up to the net and notices the net is sunk it's still there it's just sunk so he's like what the hell now so he gets over there and something had taken a big rock and weighted down the center length of the net so right in the middle just big rock weighed it down he had to fight and fight to get that rock to roll it tore the mesh he finally got it out of there had a huge hole in the net so he's like what the hell so he gets off the skiff and goes over to where he had it anchored in and uh to detach it so he could bring it back and mend it at the cabin when he gets up onto the bank he thought what he saw was a double bear imprint in the mud and he figured oh okay it was a bear but he couldn't he couldn't wrap his mind around the rock and he knew it was a rock because the water was crystal clear to the bottom I've, I've been in that area it was crystal clear to the bottom we're talking pristine Alaskan River you see to the bottom as soon as you break the tidal zone on the Wood River or the Nushkak River you can see to the bottom unless of course there's been a huge rain and you know it kind of gets murky from the rainwater it, it, there was none of that going on so it, he still isn't equating anything he just got him in this net and I'll find a different slough when I'm done a couple days pass uh, generator arrives they get it all set up his upper checks on him anything new he's like no nah, just you know just dealing with stuff mentioned none of it to his upper uh, his upper's buddy that came with to help move the generator uh, kind of jokingly laughed at him and said uh, watch out for the hairy man it'll get you you know and they just all kind of laughed and he, he just put that in the back of his mind like hmm just it, it he he wasn't expecting to hear something like that his mind was on bear and just you know random weirdness right so they leave and he's still there he was going to be there about another week so he uh he got a different piece of net and <coughs> It wasn't the size mesh that he would have preferred. It was a little bigger. It was like five and an eighth or something like that on the mesh size. So he uses that. And uh, he just modified it a little bit and went and set it on a different little channel in these sluice, hoping to get some pike. So he sets it. He goes back to the cabin. And that night, he was up and he was uh, reading some Louis L'Amour books uh, by candlelight or by lantern light. And as he was doing so, he thought he heard wolves howling off in the distance. Now, he said it sounded like natural wolf howls at first. And then these howls got so loud, but they were still, he could tell it was at a distance. He knew it wasn't wolves. And then the, the hairy man thought popped in his head. Now, once he, he said once the thought, uh, the realization happened, immediately the hair stood up on the back of his neck because it all, the, everything he had been putting off the whole time he was there for damn near a couple weeks at this point, uh, it all, it all became a reality. And so he immediately tightened everything up uh he he put the board at the door across the door um he closed the curtains in the cabin and and all this stuff right uh basically battened down the hatches and, and he he sat there reading these books all night while this chorus periodically of wolves howling continued all night stopped just before it started getting light out and he not sleeping um he ended up catching a cat nap for a couple hours once that chorus of sound stopped when he got up 
Uh, he grabbed a quick bite to eat and wanted to go check the net. Uh, he had basically, when he fell asleep, he kind of put all that stuff out of his mind and just went and handled business. So he gets to the net this time. And this time, he had a couple pike in there. And so he was happy. Okay, I found a spot. It won't be messed with here. He grabs his, uh, one was small, one was good size. So he picked the net, reset it, went back to the cabin, cleaned up his catch, um, and was basically grilling some pike on a spit right out, right out in front of the cabin. He was cooking himself some fresh pike. Uh, me personally, I used to like pike until I seen one eat something dropped over the side of the boat. I, ugh. Anyway, so as he's cooking this, he hears a grunt. And the grunt came from the back side of the cabin from where he was at. Because the little little fire pit was just off the river bank. Now on the West Channel, there's it's not high erosion there at all. So this fire pit has been well established you know and all that stuff so when he heard this grunt he figured oh crap the bear a bear smelled my fish well so he didn't want to get snuck up on so he figured he'd run this bear off so he stands up he unslings his shotgun and boom fires around in the air well as soon as he does that going away from the back side of the cabin which he said is about a 30 foot distance before the the tree line because it was cut back a little ways for the cabin uh he heard crashing and thrashing figured okay i scared that bear away good job you know reslung the rifle tended to his pike took it inside ate and decided he was going to try to move the net <coughs> excuse me move the net to a different spot and maybe catch a different variety maybe get some trout or something so it just basically he was bored and, and looking for something to do because of all his projects were wrapped up as soon as his grandpa came with the generator it was a done deal for what he was doing at this point it was just his own recreation so he goes to pull the net and take it somewhere else now he had been gone from this net uh he said maybe two and a half three hours tops he said that uh, the net had branches wove into it again. It had uh, spruce bough woven, like pulled in and, and weaved through to where it was tearing the mesh. And it's just, uh, along with willow and alders and what have you. It, and basically it, it wasn't plugged, but it was a whole bunch of shit had been weaved in there in, in just a short amount of time. So he immediately jumps up onto the bank to pull his anchor and when he does so, he noticed uh, what looked like a double bear track again. So this time, since he's got the shotgun with him, he decided he was going to investigate a little further. So he, he walks along the edge of the slough and he's looking down following these tracks. As he gets around to where uh, it, it was a little bit of a cut bank, he, uh, he gets around there, he, he gets this whiff. And he said it wasn't the smell of a like a, a bear like he's used to it was it was it was different uh he he couldn't explain it he said it smelled like death uh raw fish uh a musty odor along with a heavy urine odor so immediately you know his hair stands up and so he decides i'm not going any further because he only saw a couple of what looked like double bear tracks um and upon further inspection on his way back he noticed there was no claw marks but they, it was just so that he couldn't really make out enough definition to exactly make out if it was a bear or not. Now, he gets back into the skiff, he pulls the net in, get, does his thing, and goes back to the cabin. When he gets back to the cabin, part of the roof, the moss roof he just put on the shed, was placed over the fire pit. And it was putting off white smoke because there was still some embers in the pit and put something wet on heat it's gonna start smoking so immediately he runs over he didn't know that what was on there was from the little roof that he had just made until he got up on it moved it off and was like what the hell and went around looking to see who had done it you know calling out for his brother he was calling out for his uppa you know his uppa's friend you know who he thought who in the hell is messing with me like this well, 
he couldn't find any signs of anything except the evidence of the moss getting basically torn off of there and someone put it on that little burn area so he gets a little panicked um, because nothing is making sense uh, the weird wolf howls the the net being messed with th this thing happening with the fire pit so he retreats into the cabin for a couple hours and just starts m mulling over everything that had been going on uh, decides okay I'm gonna fix the shed because I don't want that not being right for his upper or whatever which you know I understand because he still couldn't make sense of any of it now when he goes and gets another piece of moss to put up there he hears those wolf howls this time a lot closer very very loud and obviously not a wolf because of how deep the howls were and how long they lasted a wolf can how can you know last a bit but he said this was outrageously long it was an unnatural wolf howl um and then owl hooting and all this is it, it like basically like a concert going on it, he he said it sounded like three different places probably three to four hundred yards away this is middle of the day at this point he was getting quite panic stricken he gathers everything up uh puts everything back where he needed to he, he was working nervously to get the the roof fixed and whatnot um he took the net and just drug it up put it near the shed and went and went in the cabin made sure things were secure uh went outside and boarded up the windows and because basically he was leaving he was just resecuring the windows so a bear couldn't break in and whatnot so he grabbed the extra gas from the shed and put it in the skiff and he left for that season he 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 went back uh he went down river to a family friend's cabin who had a bigger skiff and, and hitched a ride basically from there to dillingham the following year he went up and was going to do maintenance because part of the roof had uh collapsed in his up his old cabin or i i apologize i i misspoke it, it was two years later because some things happened and anyway so his grandpa had since passed and he was going to do a fix-up job because part of the roof had collapsed and so he gets up there and everything that happened from the couple years before he, he had just put it out of his mind the weird screams howls all that stuff the net being messed with the roof being messed with he, he all that was out of his mind when he comes back up and he was going to fix the roof it he he said where it was needed repairing it wasn't like a detrimental repair it, it was cosmetic more than anything because everything was still intact it just looked like something had pressed down on one of the edges of the uh of the roof line on the back side almost like something just pushed down and kind of bent things in a little bit right and it, simple enough fix it wasn't horrible However, it uh, it brought back all the memories once he was there and started working on it after a few hours. Then everything started filtering back in like, oh. And as he was doing so, he noticed it was very quiet again. So he immediately goes, okay, something something's up. Let me, let me get the shotgun. He goes in. None of the shotguns were there. The only, the only thing left there... Because, like I said, his up had since passed, and most of the stuff was removed from the cabin. Only only firearm left was a 243 rifle, which is a, a very small caliber rifle. A um, couple steps above 223. And so, he grabs that. Four rounds of ammo is all he had. He brought nothing with him from Dillingham, because for his whole life, that cabin had always been supplied. He was unaware that so much stuff was no longer there. Generator wasn't there. Uh, the wood stove that was in there wasn't there anymore. It was a drum stove now uh, that had been taken out of someone's old steam bath. Uh, just things were different. So he goes back to repairing it and he gets it done relatively quick. It was just cosmetic really more than anything. So he gets it done and as he's 
going around, he, he's basically taking an assessment of what needs to be done, anything detrimental. One of the window panes had been broken and that, that window had been boarded over inside and out um, until a, a window repair could be made. So, you know, he basically starts taking notes, walking around, has this 243 rifle slung over his shoulder and he's just taking notes, you know, and he's doing his thing. And as he circles around, he comes back around to where he was making his repairs and where he happened to have been making his repairs there was uh some of the repairs that he had done he had dug away some of the dirt from the edge of the cabin to check the lower the bottom logs right uh to check for rot or anything like that and uh he had there was fresh dirt on top of the the dead grass and what have you right there well he notices what looked like another one of those double bear tracks and immediately he, he he stopped what he was doing and started looking around checking the tree line and he got he said he got this overwhelming sense of being watched and an overwhelming sense of dread and uh again it was middle of the day uh hadn't i mean there was it was it'd been dead quiet since he got there and he decided right then and there I am I'm done I'm done here uh, I, I, I took notes I, I did my part my older brother can step up or, or another family member but I've done my part and he decides uh, I'll, I'll I'll stay the night and I'm gonna leave in the morning so he goes in he's you know finalizing all the stuff in on the inside uh, getting rid of burning old trash you know out in a little burn area just get just cleaning it up basically so he gets done doing that and uh, he said uh, time, he, he didn't have any working clocks or anything there. Everything was old and dead, um, but it was still light out. It, it, uh, it was land of the, it's land of the midnight sun that time of year. So it does get dark, but at that time of year, it's usually a little later. And then, you know, in mid June, it's, you know, the longest day of the year up here. But uh, anyway, so he was still a good month, month and a half away from that period of time but it was still light out for most of the time well it was like twilight in the sky but all the tree line was dark shadow all around um he was again reading by lantern light all the curtains that were in there were gone um and as he's reading he was in front of the biggest window there and there was this shelf built in underneath that window kind of like a, a small bar like a breakfast bar type deal right so and he was sitting there doing his reading the same louis lamore books he grew up reading they were the same ones there was like four of them that he read over and over and over again and as he was reading um directly outside the window something caught his attention now he said when he saw this movement that caught his attention it was like darkness moving and then there being more light that's all he could that's all he was able to notice in his peripheral vision immediately hair stands up on the back of his neck he leaps back from the window drops the book runs over grabs that rifle and he's thinking crap what now opens the door turns on the mag light he's looking around didn't see anything now grant you it's not all that dark but looking in the tree line is very heavily shadowed like real real dark and shadowy in the trees so that's why he had the flashlight so he's going around he's got that rifle and he's looking and looking and sees nothing circles the cabin to this he didn't start off on the side where the dark figure moved which he, he still couldn't make out he goes around to making that part the last part he checks right so he comes around and as he does he's beaming the flashlight kind of peeking around he wasn't right up against the cabin he's kind of backed up a little ways and kind of looks around and as he does so he notices something dark right at the tree line just fade into the trees a dark shadow fades into the trees right so immediately he's like all right he 
aims the rifle in that direction and shoots high into the trees not at it but high into the trees pow here's a thrashing again <laughs> felt a little better about the situation goes back inside uh, he's he's a bit shook up he kills the lantern there's no curtains so he goes to the one portion of the cabin to where uh, the new barrel stove is and the old wood stove is gone and between that stove and the wall uh, there was another small window but it was up high he slept down in that corner to where if anyone was looking in the windows they couldn't necessarily see him he, he was really freaked out and he said he sat there uh, didn't sleep at all that night um, just kind of just leaned against the wall rifle right next to him sleeping bag on the floor type deal and and just reminiscing about all the memories he had there and was just like what the you know trying to wrap his mind around what was going on because he he saw nothing definitive up to this point at, and he said at some point he started drifting off and when he did boom it was like something banged the cabin right out directly by where he was sitting uh, on the inside bam and it startled him awake and then again bam and it was like a cadence of like every two seconds bam to where everything was just shimmering uh shimmying in this cabin now it made the windows rattle it, it made the stove be like boom kind of sound it was banging hard uh he said it sounded like someone was going to come through the damn wall of the cabin wasn't with that whatsoever uh it, it freaked him out to the core to where he he was fetal positioned up clutching the rifle he wasn't seized up he was just freaked the hell out that he said that that banging continued for almost 45 50 minutes and then it stopped opposite side of the cabin a lighter banging thump 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 kept it it, it was doing the same cadence about every two seconds thump thump and it, it was it was almost like mental torture for the poor guy now he said that went on for about 45 50 minutes and this was guesstimation because he had no watch and there was no working clocks in the cabin um he said it felt like an eternity uh he said he felt like he was being stalked well he he's fully terrified at this point and he he's just tucked up right where he was and, and eventually he fell asleep when he wakes up um it's just getting like light it was it's been light but i mean lighter where the actual sunrise is about to come up and so he stands up he's shaken off the night from before and is like i'm out of here and as he does so he's cleaning up his sleeping bag mess and what have you he turns and looks at the the bigger window where he was reading and then saw the shadow move and he saw a face looking at him bent down looking at him um when they made eye contact the hairy man left uh i i know the feeling personally um he he said he was frozen in fear for at least an hour trying to accept what he saw and uh after after that hour or what have you he basically got enough gumption up to rush out look out the windows first and then rush out the door to the to the skiff fire it up and get out of there um he said he's been back once or twice the the cabin has changed hands to different family members since then and uh when he had reached out to other family members about weird experiences only one other family member had mentioned the the weird owl hoots and things of that nature but no one else had that experience which you know it's really weird it, it certain members of the family will have an experience in one area where other people from the same family during the same time frames you know, dealt with nothing you know it, it's there's a randomness to it that's just very very weird um man just just creepy stuff um and, and a lot of these encounters that are shared are more mentally terrifying than physical uh if you look at it as a whole there's a lot more loud noise uh made themselves known people get the hell out of dodge as quick as possible is typically you know the overall story of what ends up happening 
just if ugh. anyway hey uh, i hope everyone had a great uh, holiday and whatnot um let's see uh that'll be it for now and uh little people stories coming uh i've been i've been collecting a few so i could have a string of them ready to share with you guys and uh we'll catch you on the next one